All right, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good, thanks for coming. It's so good to see so many familiar faces. Hang on, I have a phone call. Turn your phones off. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, shh, hey, come on out loud, people. Um, thanks for coming this morning. My name is Stan Tequila. I'm a, a naturalist and author and wildlife photographer. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. I have a degree from the University of Minnesota and as a wildlife biologist. And um, I'm the director of a nature center in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Been, uh, been there for my whole, mo most of my career, about the last 33 years at this uh, nature center. I write a syndicated newspaper column. Uh, uh, column goes out across about nine states, has three quarters of a million readers. Anybody here read it? I didn't think so. <laughs> Zach, he's the only one. <laughs> yeah. I also have a, um, a syndicated radio show that I do. <laughs> you guys are hopeless. I have Yes, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I write books. So I, I had this strange thing as a kid. I always wanted to write nature books. Isn't that weird? You know, I, I just thought, God, I really wanted to write nature books. And about 35 years ago, um, a new company, Adventure Publications, was just starting out, and they were looking for some new authors, and they took a chance on me. And I got to uh, realize my lifelong dream of writing a, uh, a nature book. And I thought that was just fantastic. And then nobody said stop. So I just kept going. <laughs> And here we are um, 35 years later and about 200 titles later, and, um, and, and here we are talking. So uh, I'm also a wildlife photographer. I hope you've been enjoying some of the pictures up there. And uh, what else do you need to know? Anything? What's your favorite bird? Oh, I feel like I'm back with my preschoolers at the Nature Center. Let's move on. Um, is everyone having a good show? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you definitely don't want to be looking at me. All right. Let me get my technology working. Okay. So we're talking about how birds survive winter. Now, I live in Minnesota. I find myself a bit of an authority on surviving winters. Um, and so what we're going to learn today is the difference between how a bird is going to survive winter and say, for example, a mammal like you and me would survive winter too. So, um, so how can anything survive this type of brutal environment where you know, everything's covered in snow and everything's so darn cold and there's no food anywhere? So for, uh, for many of the birds, winter is actually a time of plenty. So for example, the owls uh, do very good, very good at this time of year. Um, think of it this way. The snow is uh, an insulating blanket that uh, a lot of uh, small mammals live underneath. So do you know what it's called? So you got the snow layer, and then you got the earth. That, that on the surface, under the snow layer, what that's called, anybody know? It's the subnivian layer. That subnivian layer is, in the winter time, uh, is a, a, a special environment, if you will. What we do a lot of times at the Nature Center is we're kind of showing the kids the difference in how animals survive. And you simply take the air temperature, and you know, by us it could easily be you know, zero or 10 degrees below zero. And then we take a yardstick with a thermometer probe on it and put it down into the snow, down to the earth, and it rises to 30 degrees just above freezing. And what a huge difference. And that's, then you have a 40 degree temperature gradient between the air and what's down underneath there. So those little critters are doing just great. You know, they're, they're kind of running around down there thinking this is, you know, springtime type of thing. And so birds like these, uh, like snowy owls and other owls, are, uh, take advantage of this by being able to plunge through the snow and capturing these small mammals underneath the snow. Uh, and the, the, they don't even know it's coming. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Just, just an example of how uh, snowy owls hunt like that. So 
So again, for some of these uh, species like the great gray owl, I, again, I live in Minnesota, so we have great gray owls, and they, they do very well at that time. So great horned owls uh, by us uh, nest in January and February. Well, it's darn cold at that time of year, and you wouldn't be trying to reproduce if you didn't have a good food source. And so winter is actually not a problem for some birds like that. And see, they're able to grab. Um, the Northern hawk owls, of course, are the same, same thing. They are, um, uh, is anybody familiar with this bird here? You know, it's a, called a hawk owl because it's an owl that acts like a hawk. Uh, very rapid flight and uh, uh, very different from, from others. And of course, the screech owls, too. Again, for those types of birds, it's really uh, a fairly easy time of year for them. Uh, but what about our small non-migratory birds? Uh, so from the tiny black-capped chickadee, you know, to all the birds we see coming to our feeders, our nuthatches, our cardinals, our blue jays, whatever. What about them? Uh, and that, they have a strategy, or there is a strategy in nature, and uh, we like to call it MAD, okay? You either you migrate, you adapt, or you die. <laughs> and dying is an option. When you think about it, especially in a place like uh, where I'm at, the, none of, just about none of the insects survive winter. They lay eggs. Those eggs are what survives the winter, and then they die. So it's a strategy for surviving winter by simply laying your eggs and then you, as the adult, dying off. And then the new generation starts in the spring. So that is a, it's a viable strategy, and it works fairly well for most insects like that, too. Uh, or you migrate, which... Any snowbirds here? <laughs> Lives in the cold and goes to the south? Yeah, it should be. Um, and you know, of course, I have a whole talk on migration uh, that I've done before. And then there's adaptation. To adapt is what we're going to talk about today. So, so for non-migrating birds that need to adapt to seasonal changes, they, they basically, there's some things that they can do. They can grow extra feathers, grow a, a, a layer of fat, <clears throat> uh, huddle together. Uh, shiver to generate heat, and of course, uh, torpor, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. So, from the summer to winter, we see a lot of changes in, in some of these birds. So, for small birds such as American goldfinch, they add up to one third more feathers. Average goldfinch, 2,000 feathers in the summertime, like this, and they add on another third of their feathers for the wintertime. Now, if you look at that bird, you look at this bird, that, does it look like it has more feathers? <laughs> you know? When in fact, really what it is, is uh, the outside feathers, uh, these feathers that we see on the outside of the body are, are the contour feathers. Those contour feathers don't change. You don't add on extra contour feathers. What you add on are extra down feathers underneath the contour feathers. So you don't see that. You don't see that change. You can't go, oh, look, he's got his winter coat on, you know, that type of thing. Um, and so they add it on, but you don't notice it. I mean, when you think about it, down feathers in birds are the most insulated quality thing on the planet. We as people still haven't been able to come up with something that pr uh, produces better insulated quality than feathers do. So um, they simply add on some and they do a whole lot better uh, with it. Then they take those extra feathers and they'll fluff up to capture that warmth uh, uh, next to their body. Think about it. Average bird, the body core temperature in an average bird is 107 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the inside of the bird. Compare that to say, let's say the outside temperature, which is zero. That means you've got a 107 degree temperature gradient over a one inch period, over one inch space from the interior of that bird to the outside of that bird. It goes from 107 to zero. And the greater that temperature grade in there, um, the harder it is for the bird to keep warm. So we're going to talk about this a little bit later. You guys know about the Bergman's rule, about being a bigger animals, uh, living in further northern uh, climates? We're going to talk more about that later. And that's going to come into play, so we're going to get back to that in a little bit. So. And, then, so that, and then some birds come up with an extra fat layer. Now, this is tricky. Because you're a bird. You fly. Too much fat, guess what? <laughs> you're not flying anywhere. You're not going anywhere at all. So you, um, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act to be able to put on enough fat to be able to fuel your systems uh, and keep going. And this is where things start to get a little murky. Um, because fat is what fuels their heat, how they stay warm. 
We're going to talk about that in just a second here. We're just huddling together, of course, and then this torpor. So let me back up and just talk about um, the fat in them. And this is why you're going to see in a moment that whenever we, as people, try to compare our experience with the world and how we interact with the natural world, and then we try to project that onto the birds, like how we see things is how they see things, or how, they, how we hear things is how they hear things, you're almost always wrong. Because there's really very little crossover between them. And here's a good example of it. You and I, as mammals, we eat food. And through the motility, through breaking down of food, we produce our body heat. And we keep our bodies at 98.6, right? Birds don't do that. Birds are very different. Birds shiver to, keep, to produce heat. So their thermal regulating system is very different from our thermal regulating system. So right away, there's no comparison at all. This isn't apples and oranges. This is apples and black bears. You know, it's totally different from each other. And so they shiver. So have you ever had like a bird that's hit a window and you picked it up and you feel it and it's quivering like that? And you think, oh, it must be so nervous. It must be, you know, it, it's not. It's, it's how it thermoregulates. It's how it, it shivers to keep warm, to be able to build up that body heat or to maintain its body heat on that. So it's very important. Then they burn fat to fuel the shivering. So you and I are more, well, <laughs> some of us, um, we, the food we eat is what causes us to have heat, and our fat is in reserve. Does that make sense? So fat is not something that they're like, oh, you know, extras. They don't. And besides, they can't, like I said, they can't have too much fat, otherwise they can't fly. You know, can you imagine? It's like, all right, big meal, and all of a sudden, oh, damn. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Used to work. Uh, some species of birds huddle together in the evenings or at night to uh, conserve heat. Uh, they'll find a cavity, they'll go inside, and they will uh, 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 huddle together. Uh, bluebirds do this, chickadees, nuthatches, a variety of different birds do this. And it's a, an efficient way. They've done very nice studies where they've measured the inside temperature of a cavity, to, and uh, they are able to raise the inside temperature of the cavity up to 10 degrees above the air temperature outside just from the birds huddling together inside th that cavity. So that's a fairly effective strategy uh, for doing it. And then, of course, then there's torpor. And torpor is this, um, uh, what you'd call it like a mini hibernation. So uh, the birds will... Uh, as I mentioned, they're shivering. What they'll do is they'll stop shivering for a short period of time, which lowers their body temperature, and uh, then they'll shiver again. And then they'll stop shivering, which will lower their body temperature, and they'll start shivering again. And they'll do this step-by-step -step process, bringing it down, where the temperature of the, uh, of the bird comes down from about 107. And in some species, I've, I've read studies where they've come down 20 degrees. If you and I came down 20 degrees in our body, uh, course, we'd be dead. There's just no way you'd survive that. And so this is, this is one more thing that's like we can't compare to. It's so very different from what we do. And so they'll get down to that lower temperature. The bird loses consciousness. It can't be woken up. You can't walk up to it and go, hey. And the bird go, huh, what? You know? Uh, it's not just sleeping. It is shut down all of its systems and is conserving energy because it's not shivering those times. So this is a really great effective strategy. And it's estimated that they can save upwards of 20% of their body fuel, which is fat, um, overnight by, uh, by doing this torpor thing. Towards morning, the shivering comes closer and closer and closer together. And then they raise up their body temperature, regain consciousness, and then they're back with the world again. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> wouldn't, you like, wouldn't it be kind of neat to be able to do that? It'd be really, truly amazing like that, too. And then there's other strategies that some birds do, like willow ptarmigans change color from brown to white. And they have these incredible feathers on their feet, which are just, I find, absolutely spectacular. Because when you, I, I like this. You look at this. This is a boreal chickadee. You know, this is kind of a typical northern bird for, uh, for me in Minnesota here. Bare legs, bare feet. What's up with that? You know, 
And I wouldn't want to run around with you know, parts hanging out in the middle of winter. It's not, not good at all. But these birds have a, a different circulatory system too, that circulatory system that allows blood to get to the furthest reaches of the toes, perfuse that tissue with fresh oxygen, and then be able to return back up without sending the heart into shock because what happens is, is the warm arterial blood coming down from the bird's heart then runs right alongside the venous blood that's coming back up and just like a heat transfer system, the heat goes from the arterial side to the venous side and what you've got is then cool blood going down to the feet and then cool blood coming back up and that transfer of heat takes place in the body higher up where it's not being lost to the outside environment. So this circulatory system that they do is unlike anything that you and I have also. So one more thing that's, that they have that we don't have that we can't compare to. Questions on any of that? Are you guys awake? <laughs> okay, all right. So we talked about these guys and then we've got these northern birds uh, in particular, even like most of our owls, they have feathers on their feet and on their toes, uh, which is pretty neat. I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered why the knees on birds bend backwards? Because they're rubbing their ankles? Give it to me, girl. <laughs> Did you ever see that? Birds are like this, you know, they're holding on and then what happens, it comes back and then it angles and comes back up. The answer is that's not their ankle. That's their, or that's not their knee, that's their ankle. You and I, as mammals, we are plantigrade. We walk flat footed. It's very inefficient, by the way, okay? Birds and some mammals walk around on their toes all the time like this. And so therefore, here's its toes this is the tarsus part of its bones. The tarsus bones are the foot bones, and this is the ankle. The, the fact is, is the knee is up inside the, the contour feathers. So, the, so it's really different mechanical systems than we have real different uh, kind of uh, systems for walking. Everything is different. I just love this picture here. I was up in, I was up in uh, the Arctic photographing polar bears when uh, this uh, ptarmigan came along, and I just, I'm fascinated by those feet. I mean, they put on so many extra feathers on their feet that they act like snowshoes, too, so that they're able to stay on top of the snow. But what a fabulous looking bird, and you know, talking about blending into your environment, uh, how amazing is that? Rough grouse, of course, don't change color, but they bury themselves into snow. So it's not unusual for us to have a big snowstorm, rough grouse flies literally into a snow bank and buries itself completely covered. Remember I was talking about the temperature difference between the bottom of the snow and the outside air temperature? You can have a storm raging outside with you know, 25 degrees below zero and inside that snow, they're, they're comfortable. And it's really fun to see is in the springtime when sometimes uh, there's a storm for two, three days and the birds are in that snow cave for two or three days and it's defecating and it builds up a pile of poop, you know, basically. And in the springtime when it all melts out, you can see these big piles of poop. You wonder, how did that happen? How did like 10 different, you know, droppings get in one spot? And it's from basically a bird spending a, an entire, you know, two, three days in one spot with that. So, so bald eagles move from areas, so they're adapting. They're moving from areas uh, where uh, everything's frozen solid to areas of open water like this. So for us in Minnesota, we, you know, we have bald eagles everywhere, but then they pull out of the state and they go to the Mississippi, and this is the Mississippi River here. All right, let's count the birds, ready? One, <laughs> two. So, and then they go to these open waters where they can simply catch fish and, and be able to survive. So many birds switch their diet to adapt to winter. So for example, red-bellied woodpeckers uh, switch from an insect diet over to a seed diet uh, for the winter time. So uh, I had a pair of uh, red-bellied woodpeckers nesting at the Nature Center and uh, I set up a platform to uh, film them and uh, watched as they came in with beakfuls of food. And I would take a picture each time they would come in and I'd put the pictures on the computer, blow it up and estimate, count approximately how many insects per beakful that they would have, average four to five, 
and then uh, kept track of how many times they came in to feed their babies per hour, and then how many hours during the day we had daylight, and did the math. And one pair of red-bellied woodpeckers brought in over 20,000 insects just to feed their babies that time from the time they hatched to the time they fledged. Just in that, just in that time, like 12 days, 20,000 insects, one pair. And you gotta imagine what this world would be like if we didn't have birds. We would be up to here in insects. There'd be bugs everywhere. These guys are like vacuum cleaners for bugs. Uh, all the birds are, but they switch from that insect diet and they adapt to a different diet in the winter time. So try to come up with an analogy for that for yourself. You're eating fresh vegetables or something all summer and then in the winter time you're eating just dried foods or something like, you know, that would be the only kind of analogy we'd be able to come up with. Some birds that don't uh, 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 migrate, or some birds that normally migrate, don't. Like our flickers don't, uh, or they all, most all of them migrate, and we have, you know, a small percentage of them, less than 10% of them that will stay for the winter time. These, I believe, are almost always the young males because they're not very smart, <laughs> right? It's like all young males are not real smart, so. Um, and birds move around to find food, uh, and this is called an eruption. Now, uh, I'm sure you guys know about the, uh, the, the seed forecast, the winter seed forecast. Uh, the, uh, they call it the finch forecast in the wintertime, and they're trying to predict if we'll have an eruptive year where these birds will come out of Canada and come down into the United States, and uh, they base it on how much the seed crop is uh, up there, and they're accurate. Uh, you know, 60% of the time or so. Uh, but birds like the evening grosbeak here is a bird that used to come down uh, in huge numbers. Uh, in Minnesota, we would get them every winter. I mean, guaranteed uh, they would come down. They would go as far south as Texas. This was a bird that was just about everywhere. But um, you guys are familiar with the CBC, the Christmas bird count? You guys know what this is? I don't have to explain this to you, do I? Because normally the groups I talk to, I, I mention Christmas bird count and they look at me like, what? You know? If you don't know what the Christmas bird count is, you need to. Anyhow, uh, according to the Christmas bird count data, this bird, since the year 1900, we've lost 95% uh, of the population of this bird has gone away. 95, not five, 95% of this population of this bird is gone. In the 70s and 80s, when I was feeding birds, every winter, you'd just be overrun with these birds. And now, you don't see them at all. Does anybody have these coming in in the wintertime? We had them winter before last. Yeah, that was, we yeah, that was the one time. Yeah, it was, I remember it was, it was two years ago that they kind of, it was like, wow, where the heck did this come from? Yeah. So that's the male, that's the female. And of course, they go to a, from a seed to a, a to a fruit diet also. So winter finches like the uh, uh, red poles are another that erupt out of their normal range. It's based on food shortages, presumably, because we've learned, we used to always think that all uh, eruptive behavior was due to food shortages, and, and then we learned, no, with the snowy owls, it's not. In fact, with snowy owls, it's a food abundance. When they have a lot of food, the snowy owls are catching more food and they can raise more young. And those are the years that we see that eruptive behavior where baby owls, basically, they look like adults, uh, go out across and we see them erupting in, you know, all across the northern tier t uh, states. There was one year, one made it down to Florida. So, I mean, it, it's really something. Now, whether or not these finches go on other cues other than uh, shortages we simply don't know yet. And then pine uh, siskins, same thing. They come out of these winter areas and, uh, and come down. So that's an adaptation. They erupt out. They leave. Okay, we're leaving out of our normal area, going to a new area to find food. So, so and then like the red-breasted nuthatch is a, a regular for us that comes, uh, comes down every winter and uh, we see them kind of moving around and uh, kind of like a, a, with not any specific regularity or predictability, but they're there all the time too. So 
Small percentages of uh, certain birds that normally migrate don't. Say, for example, American robins. By us, there's always American robins that don't migrate. And it's funny because, I mean, there it is. It's January, it's February. We got, you know, four feet of snow and it's colder than hell outside. And uh, there's robins. And again, I've always believed that they're probably young males because they're just not smart enough to figure it out. Or they think, I can handle this, you know, <laughs> not a problem at all. And then we also oftentimes have some birds, again, that don't migrate that normally would be, like bluebirds uh, that would come <coughs> to uh, uh, mealworm feeders in the, in the wintertime. And then some, obviously some waterfowl don't migrate. If they can find open water, they don't. So we see all these kind of man-made uh, situations in which water stays open, and we see a lot of ducks and geese and swans that stay there. Now, where I'm at in Minnesota, the, tr uh, the trumpeter swan uh, was reintroduced in the 1980s and uh, late, late 80s, early 90s. The bird was extirpated, it was killed off in Minnesota. This bird here was killed off in Minnesota by the year 1900. And so we went over 80 years without the trumpeter swan. Then they went to Alaska, they collected up some eggs, and they hatched these and they got a breeding population, and that breeding population provided young that were released into the wild, and now we have the largest population of trumpeter swans in the United States. It's huge. We've got, you can't find a puddle without another trumpeter swan in it. It's just, they're all over the place. So, uh, and of course, backyard bird feeding. Do you guys know anything about this? <laughs> So, um, so there's all sorts of things that kind of go al uh, along with this. Um, I think I've kind of covered <coughs> most everything. Anybody have any questions? Obviously, there's a backyard bird feeding section we don't have to talk about. Go ahead. So for years, it seemed like there were no bluebirds throughout the winter. Yeah. So his question is the bluebirds. Uh, for years, they didn't see many in the winter, and now you're seeing a lot of them, um, which is kind of contradictory to a lot of other people, what their observations are. What was it, three winter? No, it was, how do we, it'd be two winters ago when Texas and that kind of Oklahoma area had that big freeze, you guys remember, and the electrical grid went down. That killed off a lot of bluebirds. So I have 80 bluebird boxes on a trail uh, that I have three monitors, uh, three volunteers that go out and monitor the trail, and we keep track of the um, uh, uh, fledging of our, of our young. We average 130 to 140 uh, young fledging every year. Then that winter happened when, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of late winter, and that the south got kind of hit with that heavy rain, cold like that. Our bluebird population dropped like a rock, and we have barely recovered from that. This year, um, we didn't even have nesting bluebirds until uh, almost July. So it was, it was really sad, and we have not really, really recovered very well from it. We ended up with 107 fledging this year, but it's still like down uh, 25, 30% from what we would normally have. So most people are reporting bluebird populations down, not up. Now, this is uh, more noticing it. Right. And where are you at? Uh, Northwest Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of birds will pull out of Michigan and Wisconsin and things like that and end up going only as far as uh, uh, Indiana. Bluebirds are not complete migrators. You guys know this, right? Bluebirds are partial migrators. They'll hang out until the very last minute and then move. And they'll only move as far as they need to go and then stay. And so with the generalized you know, changing of our climates, there are places like Indiana is having much milder winters. You're going to have more of them. Uh, and that is a very good explanation of what could possibly happen, too. Go ahead. So in chickens, uh, you know, feeding cracked corn has a thermogenic effect. Yep. It actually raises their body temperature. And, you know, we're not feeding a lot of protein uh, because the cracked corn works better when it's really cold. Mm -hmm. it, it, is that, uh, uh, is there a similar thing? I mean, I, I know we're talking a lot about suet in the winter and other stuff that fat. So again, it's faster. Uh, what's happening there is that uh, the cracked corn is able to be digested quicker and uh, then transferred into that fat that, that is used as the fuel for the uh, uh, 
you know, the shaking or the um, trembling of these birds. So it, it's just, it's a faster way to get to it, if you will. And that's, and those fat proteins like suet goes very quickly too. It breaks down very uh, quickly as opposed to the proteins that really take much longer uh, to break down. That's the other thing is that, you know, our, our digestive system is just utterly different from birds. Um, you know, we, we have an esophagus that goes right to our stomach as opposed to the birds, which, you know, have a proventriculus, you know, a, a, a crop, uh, you know, before the stomach. There's so many differences between us that um, I find that very fascinating we, that we oftentimes kind of associate uh, our experience with like digestion and things like that and kind of project it onto the birds. So, yes? So what is your thought on hot pepper? Uh, my thought on hot pepper? So I tried it uh, at my house mm -hmm. and I wrote my newspaper article about it and I entitled it, uh, uh, what was it, Fire Breathing Squirrels from Hell <laughs> because my squirrels loved it. Uh, they ate it like crazy and it didn't bother them one bit. Uh, whereas, uh, and the birds didn't seem, I didn't see any difference with that. But that's just me, one guy, in my experience. I recently watched a YouTuber who uh, was kind of touting this, you know, amazing, and he showed one, one, you know, the squirrel landed on the, on the platform feeder, just kind of smelled around and went to another feeder, and that was it. And, and yep, it works. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, <laughs> okay. There are no bad effects for the birds. Not that I know of, yeah. So the capsaicin that is in that is, um, uh, you know, affects the, uh, the taste buds in your tongue. And, uh, you know, birds have uh, very uh, few taste buds on their tongues. Hummingbirds only have 10 taste buds. You and I have 8,000 to 10,000 taste buds. And um, uh, other mammals like rabbits are 20,000. So they have twice the tasting ability that we do. Um, which brings up an interesting point. When I was in college, we, I studied hummingbirds, and uh, we would put up 10 identical feeders, uh, just spaced apart, and then put in 10 different concentrations of sugar, and we would put them in different orders so they didn't. And the hummingbirds would kind of like, and zoom right in, this is the highest concentration of sugar, and that's the one they would hit the most. Which, I mean, it was clearly that they were going right to the highest sugar source. Which is interesting because that brings up another thing, like I oftentimes will up my sugar content for my hummingbird feeders in late summer when the birds are needing extra energy like that. And you can, you know, the birds really kind of come to it too. So their 10 taste buds must be all wired to sugar, you know, or something like that because it is, that's how it is, yeah. Uh, going back to the Eastern birds, did you say yeah. they drop by 95%? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the problem with a 95% drop is we don't know why. So red-headed woodpeckers is another one, 85% drop. So from where I'm at in Minnesota, red-headed woodpeckers used to be everywhere all the time. And then uh, since 1950, they've, they've dropped 85%. And we were actually, they're actually studying the red-headed woodpecker uh, by me, and um, they can't come up with any explanation other than it's kind of a habitat specialist. It likes oak savannas and... Oak savannas are just not a popular uh, habitat, you know, or not a common habitat, I should say. So, um, yeah, that's the problem. It's like nobody seems to know. Howard knows. No, that's what I'm thinking too. Back in the 60s, that yeah. was the most common fear bird. There we go. England, yes. Are they making any comeback? No. The no, they, they keep going down and down and down. Uh, one estimate I saw shows them dropping by 3% uh, a year. So it could be with, simply within you know, a very short period of time that evening grosbeaks won't be around anymore. Yeah. What, what have they eliminated? Like, is it a pesticide use and something they're eating? Or? Well, they live up in the uh, uh, spruce forests of Canada. And so there's not a lot of agriculture going on in there. There's not a lot of things happening there. So it's, you know, it's one of those things. Okay, so, you know, we all have climate change. We all know about climate change, right? And I don't want to get into the politics of it all, but um, the... The problem is, is that the climate's changing so fast. Birds are great at adapting, right? We just learned that, they adapt. This is what they do, they adapt well. But it's usually over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And we're changing the climate so fast that it's changing over 20 years. So that's the problem there, is that that fast uh, uh, 
changes are what's really kind of thrown off some birds and we're we're really seeing now there's some birds that are doing extremely well as you know uh, red belly woodpeckers are doing extremely well they're they're just flourishing across the country. Why? We don't know. But then why are red-bellied or red-headed woodpeckers declining? You know, and then so why is it that uh, uh, evening gross beaks are going away and other uh, finches are doing darn good? House finches are all across the country now. Why is that? You know, so it's interesting. Yeah. Why don't their feet stick to things in the wintertime? Because um, they don't have sweat glands. So you and I, we have sweat, uh, sweat glands. We have moisture that comes out, and we touch things, and that moisture is what freezes. They have no sweat glands. So the bird's feet are covered with scales. Remember, these birds are descendants of the dinosaurs. They come from reptiles, and uh, they still have scales on their feet. And this is why they don't stick to things like that. Now, if they got into a bird bath and got wet, that's a different story. But just generally speaking, they come to this feeder, it's a metal post, and they grab a hold of it, they're fine. There's, there's no, no issues there. Yeah, well, if it's cold enough. That's why you don't want to have a bird bath that's so deep that birds can get into it in the wintertime, get really wet, and then, like, you know, again, by me, in, where we have real winters, they, they come out of that bird bath and they can be flash frozen. And the, the feathers, I mean, the, they don't die, but the feathers are frozen. They have to then preen out all that ice, and that's a problem. So, go ahead. Are you going to go more into that good bird feeding? No. Okay. Then, to follow that question, um, what's something as backyard bird retailers, what's something we can do for our clientele to benefit birds in the winter? Um, I, I personally believe uh, offering a variety of foods uh, helps so that not only are you just offering you know, your standard black oil sunflower, but you're also offering thistle, suet, and, and I believe most importantly, peanuts. Peanuts are, man, the birds just go crazy for them. Hey, who's noticed this? I picked up, I absentmindedly grabbed what I thought was a bag of like peanut pickouts, just pe you know, peanuts in the shell, just grabbed it off the shelf, threw it in the, paid for it, got it home, opened it up and looked inside, and it was peanuts and uh, sunflower uh, parts, not chips, but like halves and holes of sunflowers. Is this something new? Yeah, me neither. Because I was pouring it into my, my peanut feeder, and of course all the sunflowers are falling through. And I was like, what the hell? I didn't even, I just you know, bought it so many times and never even thought of it. But there it was, peanuts with sunflower hearts. No? Nobody? It's like a no mess mix. It's not, it's not a mix. It's just peanuts. It's peanuts and sunflowers? Mm -hmm. You mix it yourself? Or is it you buy it that way? We, yeah, we mix it ourselves. Yeah. Interesting. We also put all uh, milk in there. Ah, see, this is just peanuts and sunflower hearts, and that's it. So go ahead. Back to your thing about the red headed woodpecker. Yeah. I was just reading that one of the main reasons the red headed woodpeckers that the European starlings are what's really driving them and taking over their cavities is that the starlings are. So starling numbers have not increased. In fact, they've actually gone down in numbers. And um, there, are, there are, I think the bird that really has more problems with it are flickers. Um, because red-headed woodpeckers are primary cavity nesters, meaning that they dig out their own cavity and then they defend it. Flickers tend to take over old cavities, which are the ones that starlings are using, and those guys are battling it out all the time too. I do believe, so uh, at, uh, we have a University of Minnesota uh, uh, area that is, has redhead woodpeckers and they're studying it right now, and starlings are not even in the equation for them, so, because they're just not there. And the habitats that, the habitat that the redhead woodpeckers is in, again, oak savannas, you don't find starlings there. So I think we as people, what we would like to do is we like to take, find a quick and easy you're the problem, <laughs> you know, and say, you're it. And it needs, you need to look at it a little bit further. By us, it's certainly not starlings, that's for sure. Go ahead. Do you know if the hummingbird population was affected by that storm two years ago? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it was. Uh, yeah, it's, there's, but now, think of it this way. Uh, we as people, we want things to, st we expect things to stay the same. Stays the same all the time. But in nature, 
it, it, it's changing all the time. It fluxes. There's highs, there's lows. There's highs, there's lows. And you just have to be around long enough to be able to observe those highs and lows to understand it. So it's normal for some bird populations to go down, some populations to go up, depending on weather and things like that. But when you look at hummingbirds, uh, it's an interesting equation. And the equation is this. You get two hummingbirds, male and female, right? And they're going to reproduce. Uh, uh, she's going to lay two eggs. That's it, not, not anymore. And with a 50% mortality rate, which is on average, so only one of those two are going to make it, they've now replaced only one adult. Okay? So now they need a second nesting season to replace the second adult. So now you've got two nesting seasons, and you still haven't added to the population. So you need a third nesting season to add to the population. Do you know what the average lifespan is of a hummingbird? Three years. These guys are right on a knife's edge. So if they're not reproducing all the time, I mean, the population could easily drop on that because, now, sure, some of the hummingbirds live four, five, six, seven years, not much, I shouldn't say seven, four, five, six years, but, um, you know, and they're, they're adding to the population, providing they have a successful nesting, providing they have, you know, higher than average uh, survival rate of their chicks and things like that. So hummingbird populations, I look at hummingbirds and think, how the hell do they even make it? Because they got everything going against them. I mean, everything going against them. And you know, a bird this big that weighs less than a penny flies from you know, here to Mexico or to South America. I mean, crying out loud. How does that happen? You know? And those babies do it on their own. They don't, they're not following their parents. They're flying on their own. How the hell do they know how to get there? <laughs> you know? And then when they get there, how do they know they're in the right spot? You know, is there a big neon sign? You know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, like those bikers welcomes, hummingbirds welcome, you know, something like that. Yeah, no GPS whatsoever. So go ahead. Um, we have, we know that the birds will get in the nesting boxes in the winter sometimes mm -hmm. to stay warm. So in our little area, there's been half of the people say you need to clean out those those boxes before the birds start to use them for the winter. The other half of our people say no, leave the stuff in there that'll insulate the box. What's your opinion on that? Again, we have 80 boxes on trail for the, for the city, for my nature center. I personally, at my house, I have 30 acres and I have uh, 15 boxes up and I clean them out mm -hmm. and I leave them open mm -hmm. because I can't afford to be replacing those boxes full of mouse piss in the springtime because it's so bad. I, so the day before I came here, so on. No, I guess it was Sunday before I came here. I was cleaning out my boxes and evicted three mouse families from it. And it's just the mice and the urine just soaks so bad through the, uh, uh, through the wood that it really destroys those boxes. So I, I sit there and kind of go, oh, I would love to be able to provide, um, you know, some kind of habitat for the birds to get inside. Because if they're looking for natural ha uh, cavities to roost in for the night, um, then I would love to be able to do that. But at what cost? So my partner says to me, she says, why don't we just provide like a box down low for the mice to, to get into? And I thought, well, that'd be great. But then they'd probably fill up both of them, you know? <laughs> and because you want to have mice around, because we have you know, a sizable owl population. It's great to be able to feed them. We have you know, our foxes, our coyotes. They all like them, you know? So why not? And I thought, well, that's an interesting thought. Why wouldn't you kind of like provide some mouse habitat <laughs> for them to keep your you know, your bluebird or your nesting box closed up for the wintertime so the birds could use it. And I thought, wow, this is a can of worms, you know, <laughs> this is going to really get into... Uh, it, oh. yeah, for me, it's a terrible mouse year. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to go back to your question about the hot pepper. So in our, we sell caged bird mixes and yeah. such, and in our, like, parent mixes, they actually have capsaicin because it helps with the plumage. Oh, nice, yeah. And it helps with the blood. Yeah, nice. So I think it's been shown that that's actually a case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. that. That makes perfect sense. You guys probably have a little bit more experience with that than I do, too, because uh, I tried it, you know, just to see what was going on. And it, my squirrels didn't, you know, didn't bother. So then, of course, at that point, I finally broke down and bought squir squirrel baffles. And you know my the way I always do this, and this is what I, my recommendations are, and you guys probably say this ten times a day. Uh, um, I always 
you know, spend the extra money for the baffle. You're going to like it. Make sure that it's far enough away from anything jumping in the surface, you know, the 5 and 10 rule or 4 and 8, whatever numbers you want to use, so that the squirrels can't jump on it. And then what I do is I put a cheap food on the ground to keep the squirrels busy so that they're not sitting there going, how the hell do I get up there, you know? <laughs> And give them something to eat, give them cracked corn, give them whatever, something cheap on the ground for them to go at, then they'll be happy and they're not going to be sitting there obsessing trying to figure out how to get onto your feeders. That's what I always do. And it works because my, my squirrels don't get on my feeders at all, which is really nice. So, Anything else? All right, you guys, have a great show. Thanks for coming.